Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today we're reviewing a brand new monitor from ASUS. In fact, it's so new that at the time of making this video, I don't think you can actually buy one. You will be able to shortly, but just not at the moment. It's the ROG Swift PG279QM, ASUS's first 1440p 240Hz IPS monitor to hit the market after it was announced back at CES of this year. With competition heating up in the 240Hz market, ASUS are hoping this display has what it takes to compete with the likes of Samsung's Odyssey G7 and Alienware's AW2721D, among others. It's also a true successor to ASUS's highly popular PG279Q, which launched over five years ago as a high-end 1440p high refresh rate display. The PG279QM not only enables a higher refresh rate, 240Hz versus 165Hz, but it also brings with it a wealth of newer monitor technologies, including wider IPS color gamuts, faster response times, an improved G-Sync processor, and more. And yes, this is a G-Sync monitor with one of the newer generation modules, so true G-Sync. However, unlike older G-Sync models, this new version works with all adaptive sync capable GPUs, whether that's from Nvidia or AMD, so you are not locked into the Nvidia ecosystem when you buy G-Sync anymore. On top of this, ASUS have integrated NVIDIA's Reflex Latency Analyzer technology, which we covered in a separate video several months ago if you want to learn more. Basically, this allows you to measure system latency on the go. Other features include display HDR400 certification with edge-lit local dimming, 97% coverage of the DCI-P3 color space, and factory calibration to a Delta E of less than 2.0. All up, it will set you back $850 US when it goes on sale soon. A high price for sure, but around the mark of other high-end 1440p displays. Design-wise, the PG279QM is very similar to ASUS's current generation of ROG gaming monitors. This means there is quite a bit of gamer style on the front and back, from the stand that features these copper highlights, to the rear which has RGB LED lighting and a pattern design. It really is a personal preference thing, so it's hard to criticize ASUS too much for continuing to use a design that consumers are still buying in droves, but I've said a few times that I'm not a huge fan. I prefer more understated or minimal designs, and ASUS are not providing that here. With all that said, what ASUS generally get right is the ergonomics of a monitor. The stand is well built and you get a nice sturdy metal legs. The overall assembly has very little wobble in it regardless of the height you adjust the monitor to, although it would be nice to get a tad more height built in. You can also rotate the screen into a portrait orientation if you want to, or just remove the stand entirely in favour of a vase mount. The port selection includes DisplayPort 1.4, three HDMI 2.0 ports, and an audio output jack, plus there are built-in speakers. The inclusion of four ports here is a bit of a surprise given we are using a native G-Sync module, so it seems Nvidia are continuing to improve their hardware and offer increased connectivity. However, these are not HDMI 2.1 ports, so all three HDMI ports are limited to just 144Hz at the maximum 2560 by 1440 resolution. ASUS continue to have a great on-screen display that's controlled through a directional toggle on the back right side of the monitor. I did find it amusing that ASUS's cheat crosshair functionality is labelled as a practice mode, but outside of that we get all the usual stuff including FPS displays, timers, black boosting modes, blue light filters and more, all in an easy to navigate arrangement. In here you will also find the controls for the reflex latency analyzer if you want to enable it. One thing that is missing, however, is support for any form of backlight strobing. Usually ASUS do like to include this feature if possible, either through their ELMB tech or NVIDIA's ULMB when using a G-Sync processor. On this monitor though, no such functionality, which will disappoint those that like to use it. Moving now into everyone's favorite response time performance section, and ASUS provide us with four overdrive settings to choose from. The first mode is off, which shows us native panel performance. Nothing too impressive here, a 9.35 millisecond greater gray average isn't terrible up against most other IPS displays, but ultimately this is insufficient for 240Hz gaming. The default mode is next up, called Normal. This setting is significantly faster than the previous mode, pushing up to a 3.86 millisecond average response time, which is very fast as you can see from the sea of green. Even though we are using our new and much more stringent 2021 test methodology for measuring response times, we're still getting 82% refresh rate compliance at 240Hz, which indicates this panel is good enough for true 240Hz gaming and the motion clarity benefits that go along with it. Overshoot is present here though to a moderately low degree, it's not very noticeable in practice, so this provides a good balance of speed and error rates. 
The next mode, eSports, is quite odd. It offers nearly identical performance to the prior mode, just in a slightly different way. You can see that the average cumulative deviation hasn't changed really at all between eSports and normal overdrive. However, the eSports mode is actually slightly slower, with slightly less overshoot. Visually, doing some Blurbusters UFO test analysis, these two modes look virtually identical, so it doesn't matter too much what you end up choosing. The extreme mode is the fastest mode on offer here, but that does come with high levels of overshoot and therefore a lot of inverse ghosting, aka bright trails following moving objects. The response time average does improve to 3.28 milliseconds, with some individual responses in the 1 millisecond range, which is what ASUS advertises. However, in practice this mode is not usable, and cumulative deviation is worse than prior modes tested. As for gaming across the entire refresh range, well really, you have a choice here between the normal and esports modes, as both do basically the same thing and provide a single overdrive mode experience. The normal mode is slightly faster with slightly more overshoot. For time reasons, we're choosing to show the esports mode here as it's probably the mode I would choose to use. The PG279QM delivers great performance at all refresh rates. Around 200 to 165 Hz, I do think the overshoot levels get a bit high, but below that, variable overdrive kicks in to balance out performance all the way down to the lower refresh rates, where you still get a 5 to 6 millisecond experience. I did not see much inverse ghosting or smearing at all when gaming with variable refresh enabled, which is great and indicative of a well optimized set of overdrive settings that don't need adjusting depending on the refresh rate you want to play at. The PG279QM stacks up very well compared to other monitors that I've tested. This display delivers both better response times and lower overshoot at its maximum 240Hz refresh rate compared to the Alienware AW2721D, although it's not quite as fast as the Samsung Odyssey G7. Either way you stretch it, the PG279QM is in the range of TN monitors in terms of motion clarity at its maximum refresh, which is excellent. On average across the refresh range, this display also produces impressive numbers. A 4.7 millisecond average response is again faster than the AW2721D by 17%, which in practice isn't going to be super noticeable, but it is faster at the same level of overshoot. However, the Odyssey G7 is that step faster again, thanks to what I believe is some of the best overdrive tweaking I've seen in a display. Cumulative deviation measures how close each pixel response gets to the ideal instant response, and you can learn more about that in our 2021 test methodology video linked in the description. The summary here is that the PG279QM has the best cumulative deviation result that I've measured from an IPS panel, slightly ahead of displays like the PG329Q and MAG274QRF-QD, while doing so at up to 240Hz. Ultimately though, it is still beaten by the Odyssey G7 with its impressive VA panel. Dark level performance is very good, no issues here and no dark level smearing to speak of as we are talking about an IPS panel. Meanwhile, at a fixed 120Hz refresh rate, the PG279QM offers very similar performance to Samsung's Odyssey G7, which is to say an excellent level of performance at this refresh, which could come in handy for Xbox Series X gamers. At 60Hz, this display delivers good performance, but it's not quite at the same level of the absolute best products on the market. Still, you get a generally solid response time here that's better than the Alienware AW2721D. Input lag is very strong, the processing delay on the monitor's side, so how long it takes to translate an input into images on the screen, is sub 1 millisecond, which is what we expect of modern gaming monitors. When factoring in the average refresh lag and the average response time, the total lag in the chain is below 7 milliseconds, which puts it in the top class of monitors that we've tested for latency, especially at this refresh rate. Power consumption is on the high side. It's no secret that the G-Sync module is a bit power hungry, and that does put the PG279QM towards the bottom of the chart, although not as bad as the Odyssey G7 overall. I don't think power consumption is too much of a concern for most buyers. Next up, color performance. The PG279QM is an excellent wide gamut display, and I say that because not only can it produce 96% coverage of DCI-P3, but it also provides 100% coverage of Adobe RGB. This makes it a great candidate for creators that require Adobe RGB or DCI-P3 or both for their workflow, as only a very small section of today's high refresh rate displays can do this. In fact, if we look at Rec 2020 coverage, an extremely wide future looking gamut, we get over 80% coverage which indicates this display is among the widest wide gamut monitors available. But it gets even better than this, because by default, out of the box, the display is set to its sRGB mode, meaning that finally we get a monitor that's both wide gamut and does not oversaturate colours in its default factory calibrated mode. 
This may seem like such a basic thing, but I believe this is one of the only monitors I've ever tested to do this, and it's the right way to do it. ASUS are giving users accurate images by default in the vast majority of desktop apps that are sRGB only, think games or YouTube video playback as examples, while still giving buyers the option to use the wide gamut functionality if they need it for more professional applications. And to make matters even more perfect, the sRGB mode does not have anything locked down. It's just a simple gamut toggle that still allows you to tweak settings like color temperature and brightness. This is utterly incredible, and I cannot praise ASUS enough for using a wide gamut panel in a gaming monitor correctly. Anyway, the performance in this default mode is decent, though not perfect. We do get a Delta E ITP around 4.0, which is pretty good, although my unit did have a slight blue tint from the factory. The big story here is the saturation performance, which sees a Delta E 2000 average below 2.0, validating ASUS's claims on their product page. In addition, we get very good color checker results, again, with outstanding Delta E's, particularly for a wide gamut display. No issues with sRGB content here. Comparing the PG279QM's factory calibration to other monitors, and in Color Checker you see the fact ASUS bothered to include an sRGB emulation mode and enabled it by fault, sends it straight to the top of this chart with results that are three to four times better than most other wide gamut monitors. Grayscale results are also better than average. Because ASUS use an sRGB emulation mode that doesn't lock down other controls like white balance, you can actually tweak this mode yourself to be near perfect. I was able to effectively hardware calibrate this display to have sub 2.0 Delta E's across the board, which is why it's so crucial to have a working sRGB mode. These results are close to as good as you would normally achieve through full ICC profile calibration. Full calibration improves performance slightly for sRGB, but is mostly beneficial if you want to use the wide gamut mode. As this mode fully unlocks the gamut, if you wanted to accurately target either Adobe RGB or P3, you should create an ICC profile to prevent slight oversaturation when working with either of those gamuts. The results I achieved were pretty strong. Brightness is good here with a peak reading of 380 nits when calibrated, that should be plenty for most users. You'll also see minimum brightness of around 50 nits, which is a good level for use in darker environments without producing a ton of eye strain. The contrast ratio produced after calibration was a bit disappointing at just 939 to 1, although this is similar to many other IPS monitors currently on the market, including the AW2721D. If you want a higher contrast ratio, really you have to go up to a VA to get something higher, and I should note here that all monitors are tested with local dimming disabled, including the PG279QM. Viewing angles are very good with this display, and I didn't experience much backlight bleed or IPS glow, although as always, this does vary from unit to unit. As for uniformity, this monitor generally provides great imagery with even tones, although there is a small amount of fall off along the outer edges, as we can see from Delta E results above 2.0 in those areas. Not too bad all up though. The final section of performance testing for this review is HDR. This is a display HDR 400 monitor, so I was never expecting anything amazing, but because it does have local dimming, it is worth testing. As we can see from our quick HDR checklist, brightness is sufficient for HDR, as is the color gamut support, but the PG279QM still does lack full array local dimming. We are getting a semi-HDR experience here. In terms of sustained peak brightness for a full white image, the PG279QM isn't too bad, delivering just shy of 500 nits, a little lower than the AW2721D, but higher than the Odyssey G7. Flash brightness can push this up to around 540 nits, which is the highest I was able to achieve with this panel. At various window sizes, the PG279QM can sustain between 470 and 545 nits, which is pretty consistent across the board, and at those lower brightness levels, the monitor can flash up to that 540 nit level or thereabouts. Not the brightest HDR implementation, but this is an entry level sort of experience. Contrast results start out promising. The absolute best case for this monitor is a full black image versus a full flash in consecutive frames. In this instance, the ASUS monitor can deliver over 40,000 to 1 of dynamic contrast. However, this reduces when talking about single frame contrast or local contrast between two areas on the screen at the same time. In the best cases for local contrast, where you have a bright and dark area far apart, I achieved contrast up to 16,000 to 1, which is about one third of the goal, which is to get to around 50,000 to 1. So already we've fallen well short of an acceptable contrast ratio. But then in our worst case test, which has a bright and dark element measured side by side, because the PG279QM does not have full array dimming, the panel reverts to approximately its native contrast ratio, which is quite low. In any dynamic scenes, 
screens that have many bright and dark areas, you will fundamentally not be getting an HDR experience. On the balance of things, when you look at this result and those in prior charts, the PG279QM in its HDR mode is anywhere from worse than SDR to slightly better than SDR for the most part. It can be worse in a sense that the halos emitting from the edge-lit local dimming zones along the bottom of the monitor can be distracting in some instances, more so than if local dimming is disabled depending on the content. In other instances, you can get a small brightness and contrast improvement. Overall, the ASUS ROG Swift PG279QM is an excellent gaming monitor and a product that feels like a worthy successor to the highly popular PG279Q. This is one of those displays that gets most of the important stuff right, leaving only a few nitpick issues that are probably asking a bit much for the technology that we have at hand today. It is a pricey monitor meant for high-end gamers, but ultimately it's a display that I would recommend, so let's break it down. In motion performance, the PG279QM is among the best monitors on the market, especially at 1440p. That's not just due to its 240Hz refresh rate, but also due to very fast response times which are in the ballpark of TN displays. This is a true 240Hz display and so far is the fastest IPS panel that I've tested, with excellently tweaked overdrive settings and a handy boost from variable overdrive. The only missing feature here is backlight strobing, which will disappoint some buyers. What impressed me most is how ASUS handles color performance here, showing they understand how to correctly use a wide gamut panel in a gaming monitor to get the most out of it for gamers and content creators. Not only are we getting a very wide gamut, but we are also getting a proper sRGB emulation mode which works without other limitations and is enabled by default. This is fantastic for achieving proper color accuracy. It prevents a nasty sunburned look when viewing YouTube videos, yet it still allows for a great balance between gaming and productivity for those that do need and want the wide gamut. So kudos to ASUS for being one of the only monitor manufacturers to get this right because the end result is a spectacular viewing experience. Other than that, we get a nice premium build quality, although the design isn't my favorite, with some handy feature additions like NVIDIA's Reflex Latency Analyzer. If I had to nitpick, it would have been nice to get a bit more HDR performance and a higher contrast ratio, but it's just not possible with an IPS panel at this price point today. And I guess the edge lit local dimming here is, I guess, slightly better than nothing at all for HDR. At $850, US this is a relatively expensive monitor, although I do expect it to last at least 5 years with the quality you are getting. I also think this price isn't too bad when you stack up the PG279QM against the competition. The other main 240Hz IPS display I've reviewed is the Alienware AW2721D, which comes in at $825. The PG279QM is fast overall in terms of motion performance, and includes proper sRGB emulation, where the Alienware monitor does not at all. The ASUS product is therefore better in most areas, and definitely worth the extra $25. It remains to be seen how it stacks up against the cheaper Gigabyte FI27Q-X, which I should be testing soon, but Gigabyte does have a hefty task ahead of them. It's less clear whether you should buy the PG279QM or the Samsung Odyssey G7, noting that the 27-inch Odyssey is $700, so a good $150 cheaper. Each product has its strengths and weaknesses. The PG279QM is flat, has a wider color gamut, better uniformity, and a working sRGB mode, making it, in my opinion, the more balanced product that's better suited to people that want to use their monitor for gaming and other tasks. And if you need that versatility, then I think it is worth the price premium. The Odyssey G7 is faster, has better contrast, includes backlight strobing, and is cheaper, so it's a good choice for gaming setups. But ultimately, whether you go for the PG279QM or the Samsung Odyssey G7, you're going to get a very good experience for gaming and other things as well, which is what you'd expect when you're buying this sort of higher monitor. It is going to last you a while and give you a nice, strong feature set. Anyway, that's it for my review of the ASUS PG279QM. This monitor we did get provided by ASUS, so it is a little bit early compared to when you'll be able to buy it, but hopefully you should see this monitor on the market in multiple regions very, very shortly. If you're interested in supporting the channel, then you can support us through our Patreon and Floatplane pages. Links to that are in the description below. You'll get access to the ICC profiles we create during our monitor reviews, behind the scenes videos, our Discord chat as well if you want to jump in and ask me some questions. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.